If you've got your Bibles, turn to Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5. That's where we are. As we say, we're running through Revelation and walking through Romans on Sundays. So Revelation chapter 5. We've just had the rapture in chapter 4. The church is in heaven. Um, The tribulation's starting, but we're going to get through this. We're just going to rush through Revelation chapter 5, do as much as we can this evening. Okay. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. No man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials, full of odours, which are the prayers of saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And I beheld, and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand, and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power, and riches, and wisdom, and strength, and honour, and glory, and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven, and on earth, and under the earth, and such as are in the sea, and all that are in them, heard I saying, Blessing, and honour, and glory, and power, be unto him that sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb, for ever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down, and worshipped him that liveth for ever and ever. Okay, verse 1, here we go. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. What is this book? The Bible talks a lot about books. The books were opened and a book, the book of life, the Lamb's book of life. Well, what is this book? The answer to the question really is nobody knows. It doesn't actually tell us, but speculation says it could be the book of Revelation. Seven seals. And the book of Revelation, in the next two chapters, it begins with the opening of these seven seals. So it could be the book of Revelation. Or it could be the entire Bible. Or some think that the book could be the book of Daniel, turn to Daniel, chapter 12. Daniel, chapter 12, verse 4. But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end, many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Well, that's a great verse for Um, telling us about the end times, but it talks about the book there. So some people think it could be the book of Daniel. You'll have to do your own homework. Some have even said, I've, I've heard, that it could be the deeds to the earth. I'm not sure about that, but I've heard it said. But one thing that is interesting out of this, in regard to what the book is, if I don't know if you have this on your Bible, but if you look at the back of a Bible, look at this. One... Two, three, four, five, six, seven. 
That's where they get it from. Look at this. This is another one. Look at this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's where they put it on the Bible. Cambridge do the same. You look at this. This was specially made, but they put it on the back of that. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The seven seals. I had a... um. The, this one was falling to, to bits, and so I had it rebound. Yeah, this is the only time the Bible has ever been out of my um, my hands for a day. I hated it, and I gave it to a guy who um, who was re, who was binding the, the Cambridge. He was actually doing Cambridge Bibles and binding them up and sending them to America. So I said to him, "Could you do me a special and could you re, rebind my Bible?" He said, "Yep, no problem at all." <coughs> Cost an arm and a leg, cheeky. I thought he was going to give me a deal, cheeky dog, um, but he never did. And um, so he, he um, rebound this, and so I thought, oh, this will be great. So he did it, and look at it, never put any seals on the back. <laughs> I'll tell you, because I throw a stone to his window, may still do. Um, but yes, yeah, so if you're going to get it bound, don't, don't do that guy, I'll, I'll tell you who he is. Um, <laughs> but most Bibles will have the seven seals on the back. Where do they get it from? They actually get it from the scriptures. So it's interesting. So, and I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the back side sealed with seven seals. So that's why you have the seven seals on your Bibles even today. It's from the scriptures. Um, Verse 2. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice. That made me smile. A strong angel. What, is there weak ones? Um... Proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? I heard a guy speak once, and he was talking about how Satan gets bound um, by an angel. And because it says strong angel there, the Lord chooses to bind Satan with his weakest angel. <laughs> that little, you know, that little skimpy little angel in the corner. Well, you go and bind the devil, because when God gives you the authority to do it, he says, you know, there's no, there's no problem there. Made me smile. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? Look at verse 3. And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. No angel, no saint, no preacher, no teacher, no scholar, no bishop, no pope, no pastor... No one, not one single person, was or is worthy to open this book. Now the word open here, this is interesting, the word open here means to make anyone understand it. In other words, no one, no man was able to make anyone understand it. Follow me through here. It's not merely to open the book to look at it, but open the book so you can understand it. Look at the following verses. Turn to Luke 24. So it's more than just opening the book. It's getting to people, it's getting us to understand it. Look at Luke 24, verse 45. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. What a cross-reference that is. Verse 44 said, And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you that all things must be fulfilled which are written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. Great verse. I've got a cross-reference there. Just let me check that out. I don't know if it's relevant to this. Um... Oh, it's an interesting verse, and they, uh, Genesis 40, verse 8. And they said unto him, We have dreamed a dream, and there is no interpreter of it. And Joseph said unto him, Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me then. Tell me them, I pray you. Interpretations belong to God. But here, the understanding, making them understand it. You'll also see this context in Acts 16. Turn to Acts chapter 16. Scripture with Scripture, that's how we learn about the Scriptures, how we understand the Bible. Acts 16, verse 14, And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple, of the city of Thyatira, um, which worshipped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened. Well, obviously it's not open heart surgery. Open to understand. 
that she attended unto the things which are spoken of Paul. So that word understand, um, open there, means also to understand. So it's not merely just opening the book, but opening the book so that all can understand. Who is worthy? Well, there's no one worthy except the Lord. People say, well, you know, should we, shouldn't we go to Bible college to understand the scriptures? That's the last thing you want to do. You want to get um, alone with the Lord. Of course, there's plenty of commentaries if you want them as well. But get alone with the Lord and ask the Lord to teach you the scriptures. Help you understand what you're um, reading. And, you know, and, and the other thing, of course, is to keep cross-referencing scripture with scripture. That's how we learn. That's why I say a wide margin Bible is the best thing you can invest your money in put, and then put scriptures next to scriptures and so you have threads and you can follow themes. One thing we've recently done, we've just completed it, it's taken well over a year, maybe two, um, not that we've been working solid on it, but we've actually cross-referenced now our Bibles with the Time for Truth News, which really helps us. So if, if you want to talk Calvinism... I turn to a verse that um, you know, is associated with the errors of Calvinism, and then I've got studies by the side of it, Time for Truth News, Issue, da-da-da, and what page it is. It's, it's helped us, and it helps me to um, convince the gainsayers, <laughs> um, as they say. Okay, so, Revelation 5, 2, and 3, going back to that. Um, notice also the word worthy. None of us are worthy of anything. None of us deserve anything good. You think you're good enough. You deserve respect. Well, compared to each other, maybe. But compared to Jesus Christ, we ain't worth spit. He is perfect, he is holy, he is God. And we are nothing. Look at this for some great verses. Job 15, turn there. Job chapter 15, verse 16. How much more abominable and filthy is man? which drinketh iniquity like water. That's you and me. We're saved sinners, but we still sin. We're saved. Thank God we're saved. We're in the body of Christ, but we're still in the flesh. Spiritually, we're in heaven, but we're still in the flesh, we still sin. I hate it. I hate the filth. I hate the the thought life that you can have, and the daydreaming, and all these things, you know. So we're trying to take every, you know, captive every thought. It's hard. Living the Christian life is hard. But what is man? Look at Psalm 14. Psalm 14. Verse 1 to 3. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. The Lord looketh down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. They are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. That's what the Bible says. The scriptures say. That's what God says. And by the side of that, I've got the ministry years, issue 64, page 32, so that you can have a little study on it. Okay, Isaiah 64. Turn there. Isaiah 64. Verse 6. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags, and we do all and we do sorry, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. That's us. Directly context, Israel. Dual application, us. Mankind. So Revelation 5, I'm rushing through it, we're not spending loads of time on it. Verse 2 and 3, And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? Um, And no man in heaven nor in earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereupon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. Where are we in context here? Where are, we, where are we positioned here? Where's this talking from? Heaven? Heaven? What have you got in heaven there? Tears? Isn't that interesting? Tears in heaven. Twice it's mentioned, I think, um, tears in heaven in regard to the judgments. Very interesting. 
He'll wipe away your tears, but there'll be tears in heaven. You don't have any regrets, folks. I keep telling you this. You want to be sold out for the Lord, doing what you can, because you're going to have so many tears in heaven. If not, wept much. Why? Well, do you weep? And if so, what for? When was the last time you wept? And how many of you have ever wept? Do you call yourselves Christians? Some of you, I don't think, are. <laughs> oh, come on, man alive. You all probably are. But you better, you better make sure you're Christians. And do you weep? And have you ever wept, ever wept for souls? Have you ever wept because somebody in your family isn't saved and you so long and desire them to be saved? Husbands, wives, children, family, uncles, you know, people in the family. Have you ever wept? And if not, why not? Are you hard-hearted? Do you need God to soften your heart? It's not all about, you know, doctrine, this, doctrine. What, what's your real Christian life like with your character? Oh, yeah, we can get the doctrines right. I was talking to somebody today, you know. We can get all the doctrine right in that sense. But what are you really like as a person? Are you soft-hearted? Do you ever look around and see what kind of Christians the Lord has to work with? Makes you want to cry. <laughs> Especially with some of the Christians we have to deal with. We look at our own lives as well. What kind of Christian are we really? Some King James Version, authorised version only, Bible-believing Christians are some of the most arrogant, self-opinionated, self-conceited, trouble-making, hair-splitting idiots I've ever come across. Being honest with you, I've dealt with loads of them, still do. What kind of Christian are you? Boy, the Lord doesn't have much to work with, does he? Hey, you look at your own lives and you think, what are we like? Oh, we're good actors, but what are we really like? What kind of testimony do we give? How does the world see us? How does your family see you? How does your enemies see you? As well as your work colleagues. What kind of Christian are you? Wept much. Do you weep? Galatians 6.3 is one verse that we keep going back to all the time. And it's, it's a verse that I suppose every Christian really ought to live his life on. Galatians 6.3 For if a man thinketh himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceiveth himself. You think you're something, do you? So, and I wept much. Why? Because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. Nobody's worthy. I wept much. Nobody is worthy. How tragic and sad that is. Verse 5. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. That's always got an answer. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. The Lord Jesus Christ is from the tribe of Judah and he is called the son of David in Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. He hath prevailed. Jesus Christ prevailed over the devil in the wilderness in Luke 4. He prevailed over the devil in Gethsemane in Matthew 26 and at Calvary in Matthew 27. And he conquered sin and death and recovered what Adam had lost. Hence why he's called the last Adam. The only person who deserves total respect, total honour, total praise and glory and is worthy of it all is the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn to Habakkuk. Habakkuk, as some people say. Chapter 3, verse 3. God came from Teman. That's a funny one to answer your critics with. Well, where did God come from? Well, the Bible says God came from Teman. That would shut them up. <laughs> and the Holy One from Mount Paran, Selah. His glory covered the heavens and the earth was full of his praise. Well, he's going to get his praise, what he deserves very soon. But we should be praising God and living a life that pleases the Lord. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. I've got a cross-reference here. Turn to Genesis 49. <clears throat> Genesis 49. Verse 10 and 11. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, 
nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh, capital S, come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be, binding his foal unto the vine, and his ass's colt unto the choice vine, he washed his garments in wine, and his clothes in the blood of grapes. There's seven titles of Jesus Christ in the Pentateuch, which is the first five books of Moses. He's the rock, he's the seed, he's the scepter, he's the star. He's the shepherd, he's the stone, and he is Shiloh. Seven titles of Jesus Christ in the first five books of Moses. Also here in verse 11, just something very interesting. Note here, binding his foal unto the vine and his ass's colt unto the choice vine, semicolon. That's his first advent. Look Look at after that. He washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. Second advent. Do you know what you've got there by semicolon? You've got the first and second advent. How about that? In one verse split by a semicolon. And in in regard to the blood of grapes there, you want to write down, if you've not got this there, for for a cross-reference, Revelation 19, 13, Isaiah 63, 1 to 6, and Revelation 14, 20. Amazing. This book fits perfectly together. It's an incredible book. And the deeper you go, the bigger it gets. That's why I have to talk fast, to cram it all in. So I apologise. So back to this, Revelation 5. <clears throat> verse, where do we get to, in fact? Oh yeah, this is interesting. The Lamb, I've just put here on verse 5. Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah. You see, the Lamb becomes the Lion. The Lamb, behold the Lamb of God, John 1, 29 and John 1, 36. The Lamb becomes the Lion. Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. Now he comes back as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. You can kick a lamb to death. God forbid you would, but you can, and it won't bite or attack you. You try doing that to a lion. And he's coming back as the Lion. I think Rutman's got one of his... um, Shirts, isn't he? You know, that he's printed one of his arts. Um, guess he's got a picture of Jesus Christ on the white horse coming back with a sword out of his mouth. And it's got, guess who's coming back underneath? And boy, is he mad. <laughs> and I love that. And he's coming back as the lion of the tribe of Judah. Verse 6, And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and, um, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. Now, we covered, we, in our last sermon, which is a bit wild, um, I think some of you missed that one, you'll have to pick that up on the website, in regard to the cherubims and the missing fifth cherubim. Very interesting study. Um, but here, in verse 6, um, the Lord Jesus Christ is directly referred to as the Lamb only twice in the Old Testament. Isaiah 53 verse 7 and Jeremiah 11 verse 19. Only twice in the Gospels. John 1.29 and John 1.36. Only once in the book of Acts. Acts 8.32 and only once in the Epistles. 1 Peter 1.19. But he is referred to as the Lamb 27 times in the book of Revelation. This book is wild. The lamb as it had been slain. Having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. So here, John in his vision sees Jesus Christ pictured as a literal lamb. We take this book as far as we possibly can literally. We don't spiritualize it. We take it as literally as we possibly can. Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. John 1.29 So John sees the Lord Jesus Christ as the slain Lamb of God walking to the throne of God and taking the book out of his hand. Verse 7 And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne, out of his Father's hand. And note the lamb here has seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God. Like somebody said once, it's not hard to, um, what is it, un- hard to understand, it's hard to believe, or hard to believe, hard to understand. You understand what I'm saying? This 
book, as it's written here, we take as literal as you possibly can, all the way. We don't try and spiritualize it, saying, making it saying something when it isn't. So we're trying to read this as literally as we possibly can. So, and I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. Verse 7, and he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. As we've said previously, no one except the Lord Jesus Christ is worthy to take and open the book. Look at verse 9. And they sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. Thou art worthy. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. Now this slain lamb who is Jesus Christ will be the only one in heaven bearing scars. Have you ever thought about that? For all eternity we shall see the Lord Jesus Christ's scars. He never gets rid of them. He's the only person in heaven who has scars. I've got scars. Two hip replacements, I've got scars. Busted elbow, had operation on that, scars. Torn shoulder muscle, scars. When I get to heaven, I've got no scars. But Jesus Christ has. My scars are gone forever. But his will be a reminder to everyone of his great love and the sacrifice he made to bring us back to God the Father and to bring us to heaven. Look at this, John 20, turn there. John chapter 20. That's something, don't you think? John 20, look at verse 26 to 28. And after eight days again, his disciples were within, were, were within, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace be unto you. Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Feel the scars. Put your hand in the side that the sword went in. Oh, Jesus Christ, when he rose from the dead, had scars. Look at verse 19, same chapter to 21. Then the same day, at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had said... And when he had so said, he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad when they saw the Lord. What verse did I say? To 21, didn't I? Then said Jesus to them, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so I send I you. And Luke 24, turn there, Luke 24. Verse 36. To 40. And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted and supposed that they had seen a spirit. And he said unto them, Why are ye troubled? And why do thoughts arise in your hearts? Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. And handle me and see, for a spirit hath not flesh and bones as ye see me have. And when he had thus spoken, he showed them his hands and his feet. The Lord Jesus Christ bears these scars. For eternity. When I see these folks with terrible, terrible facial disfigurements through disease or horrific acid attacks, as seems to be the thing that some wicked, satanic people are doing these days, I think to myself, if you're a Christian, one day all your scars and disfigurement are just going to go. You're going to be a perfect, perfect person, human being, but with your resurrected body. No longer you will you bear any of your scars. But the Lord Jesus Christ will bear his forever. He bears the scars of his blood atonement for eternity. And every time we see him and we see his scars, we will remember what he did for us. I thought that's a lovely picture there too. Revelation 5, verse 7. 
And he, he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, and the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odours, which are the prayers of saints. Verse 9, And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book, and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain, and hast redeemed us to God by the blood of e- blood out of every kindred and tongue, and people and nation. Before, <laughs> get ready girls, before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odours, which are the prayers of saints. And they sung a new song. They sung a new song. Now listen, let me put this in context. Don't get offended with this. Take it easy. Deep breaths. All these folks are worshipping God, the Lamb. And they are singing. And do you know what they are singing about? Well, you're going to find that out in a second. But if they were from the church of Christ and they believed in baptismal generation, you've got to be baptised to be saved, even um, preaching Acts 2 verse 38, well if they got to heaven on the basis of that, they would obviously, they would obviously want to sing about water. Because that's how they got to heaven, through water. And they would sing something along the lines of, girls? Old man, river, and old man, river. Now, if you believe in works, <laughs> if you believe in works to get you to heaven, you would want to sing about works if you were in heaven. And they would probably sing something along the lines of, girls? Working nine till five, run away to make a living. Now, if you were a Calvinist, oh, come on, stay with me, folks. If you were a Calvinist, you'd want to sing about flowers, especially tulips. Something along the lines of this, girls. Where have all the flowers gone? Now, this one I struggled with a bit, but we landed with one on this one. Now, if you were a hyper-diaper dispensationalist, especially one of those that believes in the church started in mid-Acts, you would want to sing about Paul, followed by a chorus of mid-Acts church, you know, nonsense. Now, this I struggled with, but we came up with one. Girls... Holy, 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 I'm begging of you, please don't baptize me. <laughs> <laughs> eh? Because they don't believe in water baptism, of course. Now, what about old Bobby Mitchell eh? and the, the post-tribbers and the old Kent Hovines of this heretical world? The post-trib crowd... What would they want to sing about? Well, they'd want to sing about meeting the Antichrist, wouldn't they? Because they're certainly not looking for Jesus Christ. So we came up with this one. Girls? And I saw a white horse ridden by a man with bow and arrow. Now, those of you, and that's doctrinally incorrect, because there's no arrows, of course, in Revelation 6. But that was from Glenn Campbell's album, his Christian album, about the, the apocalypse and the four horsemen. Sung much better than Glen Campbell by our, by our team of Time for Truth singers. Amen. Amen. <laughs> now, what about the Pentecostals? Well, what would they sing in heaven? They'd want to sing about signs and wonders. They'd want to sing in a heavenly language. <laughs> uh, g- <laughs> girls. <laughs> and those of you know that's from where? There, yeah, she got it. So they'd want to sing like that. You'd have to have an interpreter on that one, I'm afraid. 
Now, I thought about, what about if the Seventh-day Adventists made it on their own, um, you know, on their own gospel? Well, of course, they, um, they uh, worship on a Saturday, and if you worship on a Sunday, that's the mark of the, you know, that's the mark of the beast. So, if the Seventh-day Adventists made it with faith and works and worship on a Saturday, what kind of song would they want to sing in heaven? Girls? Saturday nights at the church. <laughs> <laughs> and what about the version crowd? We were thinking about this. What about those people that have an NIV or a New World Translation or a New King James or an ESV? These people that have all these verses missing. What kind of song would they want to sing if, if you know, they make it to heaven? Well, they were seeing something along the lines of this. Girls? Because <laughs> I miss you. <laughs> and I need you. You get that? <laughs> I don't think that went down well. Okay, and then of course, I had to put this in. The brethren. Well, the brethren. <laughs> this made me smile. The brethren. Oh, these dear, dearly beloved people. Now, of course, some of them are going to make it to heaven. I was with two today that have come out, the exclusive brethren. They were telling us the stories of that cult. Um, So the brethren, they get to heaven. What would they want to sing about? They would sing something along the lines of, girls? Wherever I lay my hat, that's the assembly. (laughs) (laughs) Oh dear, not enjoying this, are you? I am. Well, if you're taking offence to this, good. Um... What about the Roman Catholics? Well, if they got to heaven, imagine that. Imagine if they got to heaven, what song would they want to sing about? They would sing something along the lines of this. Girls? They were merry, merry, sweeter than the honeycomb. And of course we'd go on and on. But let's just give you two more. What about the Jehovah's Witnesses? Imagine, may, imagine the Jehovah's Witnesses getting to heaven. What would they sing about? It would, be a, it would probably be this song. Thank you, girls. And what about the Mormons? Last one. The Mormons would do this. They would sing this song in heaven. Thank you, girls. I want to ride my bicycle. I want to ride my bicycle. Well, that's enough of that. But listen, none of those songs are in heaven. I give you a little bit of joke. Don't write in or send me emails and (laughs) saying all this. Um. All I'm saying to you, in heaven there's none of that stuff. Thank God for that. We are going to be singing about one thing here, and that's the worthiness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And look at this. Well done, by the way. Um, Look at this verse. Where were we? Verse 9. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood. Out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. You know what they're singing about? They're singing about the blood of Jesus Christ. Because that's the only thing worth singing about. His death, burial and resurrection, the shed blood, his blood atonement. Everything shed for you. He gave his life and shed his blood so you could have a place in heaven. You could have your sins forgiven. What about these two? I'll give you two verses about the blood. Thank you, girls. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's face and sinners rushed beneath that blood lose all the guilty sin. Or what can wash away Listen, that's the only thing worth singing about. The blood. You take the blood out of Colossians 1.14, you've got a satanic Bible. Because it's the only the blood that you can be redeemed by. They're singing about the blood of Jesus Christ. And again, if you turn to Hebrews chapter 9. Turn to Hebrews chapter 9. <clears throat> That's why we make such an emphasis and put such an emphasis on the blood of Jesus Christ. Look at um, Hebrews chapter 9. Let's just read in a, a little bit here. 
Then verily the first covenant also had also ordinances of divine service and worldly sanctuary. For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the showbread, which is called the sanctuary. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant. And over it the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat of which we cannot now speak particularly. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. But, unto the, but into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood. He had to take blood, which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people. And you keep reading down until you hit verse 12. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, Jesus Christ's, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us, because the, the tabernacle on earth was a picture of that that was in heaven. And it had to be the blood of Jesus Christ, because you cannot get saved without the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's where in verse 24 it says, For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with the hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Hebrews 10.4, it's worth reading both those chapters, by the way. It is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Look at verse 11. And every priest standeth daily, ministering and offering, oftentimes the same sacrifice, which can never take away sins. Religion can never take away your sins. Blood sacrifices here can never take away your sins in this dispensation. The only way you can be redeemed is by the shed blood of Jesus Christ, who is the perfect Lamb of God who came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. There's only one thing worth singing about, and that's Jesus Christ. He's the only one that's worthy, and it's his blood that we sing about, even in heaven. I said I'm rushing through. Time's gone, but let's just finish it off if we can. Revelation chapter 5, verse 10. And hast made us unto our God, kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Note here, <clears throat> we are not reigning now. We're not trying to usher in the kingdom now like the Pentecostals are. We're not trying to do that. And the JWs, they're doing the same. They're in the wrong dispensation, the wrong kingdom they're trying to bring in. You're not getting your crown without carrying your cross. It's work and suffering now. The Lord Jesus Christ bore his cross the first time to get his crown the second time. If you're trying to wear a crown now, bringing in the kingdom, you're in the wrong dispensation. The amillennial and the postmillennial crowd are just another bunch of Bible-perverting, scripture-twisting heretics who are, the bl who are a blight on the body of Christ. Note in verse 10 it says, shall reign. That's future. That's the second coming of Christ. Uh, uh, bringing in then the millennial reign of Christ, the kingdom of heaven. Setting up his kingdom of heaven on earth. It's not a heavenly spiritual reign, but it's a reign on earth for a thousand years. Revelation 20, God willing, if the rapture hasn't happened, we'll get to that passage. So it's future. It's not bringing in the kingdom now. Verse 11. And I beheld and heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders. And the number of them was ten thousand times ten thousand and thousands of thousands. Something interesting here. Oh yeah, thousands of thousands. This is the only, only indefinite number in the book of Revelation. That's interesting. Why do you think that is? Saying with a loud voice, worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honour and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard I saying, blessing and honour and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb for ever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth for ever and ever. Notice that in verse 13. Something interesting there. Even the animals praise God. <laughs> how, about, how mad is that? Look, well, turn to Psalm 148. 
Psalm 148, animals can't talk. Psalm 148, <clears throat> verse 7 to 13. Praise the Lord from the earth, ye dragons and all deeps, fire and hail, snow and vapour, stormy wind fulfilling his word, mountains and all hills, fruitful trees and all seeds, beasts and all cattle, creeping things and flying fowl, kings of the earth and all people, princes and all judges of the earth, both young men and maidens, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for his name alone is excellent. His glory is above the earth and heaven. And of course, we had in Numbers 22, turn there, and we finish with this, Numbers chapter 22, verse 27 to 30, and when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, you know who the angel of the Lord is? She fell down under Balaam, Balaam, and Balaam's anger was kindled, and he smote the ass with a staff, and the Lord opened the mouth of the ass. And she said unto Balaam, she said, the ass spoke, what have I done unto thee that thou hast smitten me these three times? And Balaam said unto the ass, <laughs> Because thou hast mocked me, I would there, I would there were a sword in my hand, for now would I kill thee. It's, it really makes me smile, this story. The ass turns around and speaks to Balaam. Balaam, like, he may have been shocked, but he doesn't say, what's going on here? He just automatically has a conversation with the ass. Why have you, the ass has turned around and says, why you hit me? And he says, you know, he said, well, <laughs> he just responds to it. That made me smile. And the ass said unto Balaam, Am not I thine ass, upon which thou hast ridden ever since I was thine unto this day? Was I ever wont to do so unto thee? And he said, nay. So he's having a conversation with the ass. Just, just normal day, every day <laughs> conversation. Incredible. So the animals praise God. It's incredible. Folks, we haven't got a clue. We're only given snippets of what's going to happen. We're given, you know, snippets of heaven and things. I told you before, somebody said, we're not given too much um, information about heaven, otherwise everybody go commit suicide. Get saved, go commit suicide and just go there. Um, I can understand what he meant. But um, we're given snippets of what it's like. You know, we're, we're running through the book of Revelation. We could park in Revelation 5 and speak about that for week after week after week. Same with every chapter. But listen, we'd never, you know, I'd never get anywhere else. So I've got to rush through this. So that's Revelation 5. I don't think I've done that for a while to an actual chapter, which I'm pleased about, thank you, Lord. And then we're going to pick up, we're going to pick up from uh, Revelation chapter 6, which is where it all kicks off, this tribulation, um, Jacob's um, trouble, Daniel's 70th week, next time. Hopefully you've had a little bit of uh, enjoyment out of those, <laughs> those songs. Um, and yeah, if, if, if we rush through with regard to the scriptures, like I said before, I know I talk fast and some of you complain about that, but just pause it, go back, press pause, take them down. And if you haven't got a wide margin bar, get yourself one cross-reference because you're missing out. Every time you're missing out, you want to be writing these verses down and cross-referencing them with what we're talking about. So you have a thread that you can follow. Amen. Thanks. Amen.